Uh, hello, my name is Bo Shan. I'm the software engineer at ArcBlock. So today I'm going to talk about the understanding Erlang kernel. Uh, first of all, this is my son. Uh, his name is Bo Yan. Uh, he is uh, he's just nine months old. He's the first child process I spawned with my wife <laughs> last year. Uh, and he loves play. And this is the best when he goes, goes to sleep. Otherwise, I got a lot of handle info changing my diaper <laughs> messages at the night. But uh, yeah, that's, that's hard, uh, but uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, so we, why we talk about Erlang kernel? So uh, be, today's topic is understand Erlang kernel. But I'm no way that uh, an expert on the Erlang kernel. Because I think Erlang kernel is, uh, is awesome, and uh, it has a lot of good stuff. However, I can't find a lot of talks or uh, books uh, really talking about the Erlang kernel. So I uh, set, I give myself a goal that uh, I'm trying to, so I decided to talk about the Erlang kernel uh, in order for the community to, you know, to uh, uh, inspire more people to try to, you know, know this, uh, know this topic. And I'm, I'm thinking to have my talk as an introduction uh, for people whoever is interested in this uh, Erlang kernel. And then at least you know how to uh, get started. So here is our agenda. Uh, we will have, when we start, can you guys see this? Uh, okay. Okay. So when we start an Erlang shell, and then there will be 40 processes in, the, in this Erlang beam. So we're going to spend one minute on each one and then we're gonna have 40 minutes, all right? That's not true. That's gonna be boring. Uh, so instead, I'm gonna show you guys a live demo because a uh, live demo is awesome and it never goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with Erlen, uh, let me type this. I will format, hello world. Okay, now the hello world was printed out and that took 13 seconds. See, that was easy. Okay, uh, so yeah, that is my uh, demo. So you guys probably wondering, I'm here for the Erlang kernel, why this guy is showing me the hello world? Uh, so here is a real agenda. I'm trying to explain how the Erlang's hello world uh, works, and then in extension to, uh, to explain how the kernel's application works. Of course, uh, with this 40 minutes, we don't have uh, enough time to cover everything, but I'm just uh, trying to uh, do my best here. Okay, now let's talk about the processes. You know, the, in Erlang, we have a lot of processes. And the, because of the process, Erlang makes it a very different languages than a lot of other languages. So Erlang is a functional programming languages, right? We write functions, and then we have some data in, and then the functions do some transformation, and then we get the data out. So normally, we don't, we just need to call the functions, and then when we need the processes, there are a few scenarios. First is when we need to you know, uh, run things concurrently. So we just uh, spawn a few pro processes and run the, run the functions. And then when they finish running, and then the process is going to die. So normally, we want the process not die, the long-lived process. So in Erlang, the only way to have a process that not die is for that process to call some recursive functions so that the process will not die. And then in that recursive function, we have some arguments. So that argument becomes the state of that processes. And then normally, we will just uh, run those a lot of processes, each with their state, and then update their state. And then we can give some name to that processes. Once a process has a name, other process can talk to that process by sending a message. And then other node, other uh, process on the different node can send a message to the register process. So let's see how many uh, register the process is there when we start a Erlang beam. So when we type uh, the regs, it will show you the registered named process in your Erlang instance. So it has a name, the PID, initial call, reds, and messages. Uh, so the message zero means uh, there's no uh, lingering messages, which is good. The reductions is uh, roughly how many code this process has been executed, give you a rough idea how busy that process is. And then here we have the PID uh, from zero to up to 77. So let's take a PID first. 
So the PID will consist of three numbers. The first number, zero, will always be zero if we spawn a process that in our local. And then, as we know that Erlang is a dynamic typed languages, so there is no type information during the compile time. So how does Erlang run type to know which type this variable is? Uh, so we put the type information inside of the data. So in Erlang, uh, we, uh, Erlang is using a, a, a thing called staged, uh, staged tagged schema. Uh, schema. So uh, which is for every process, uh, they have some uh, pre-given bits. So that indicating the type of that. So for the PID, uh, the type, uh, the, the last four bits are 0011. And then the rest would be the the, re the rest would be the actual content, and then the first number here, the zero here, which is marked by this uh, 15 bits, marked by the plus sign. So those 15 bits are the first uh, are the second numbers here. So the minimum it's all the zeros, uh, all the bits are zero, so which is zero. So the maximum is all the bits are one, which goes to this uh, three two seven six seven. So the first process will be number zero, and then the next one would be one. Continue on up to you got the three, two, seven, six, seven. And then the next one is gonna go back to zero, and then the third number here is gonna increase by one. So the third number here is gonna be uh, represented by the rest of the bits here marked by the minus sign. So as we know that we can have a lot of processes in here. So when we spawn a new process like this, uh, when we spawn a new process, it, it's going to give us a uh, PID, like 85. If we do that again, uh, it gives us uh, 87. So where the heck is 86? So uh, the answer is when the, the shell itself is also a process, and then when we type some command, it will spawn a new process as an evaluator to evaluate uh, the, the command we typed here. So if we so that will consume as one process. So if we do if we spawn two process in one command. So the right now we are in 87, and then the 88 will be uh, will be the evaluation process. So and then the first spawn will be 89, and then the second will be 90, just like that. Okay. So with uh, so with this knowledge, and then let's take a look at the very first process, zero 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 it got to be some special process, right? So the name of the process is called init for the obvious reason. And then the, the initial call, which is what is a function to call this, uh, to, to spawn this process. So the initial function call is called OTP ring zero. So when I, when I first uh, see this, I have no clue on what are OTP ring zero. I thought, is there have some, something to do with the uh, onion ring? Uh, so I did some research, uh, and then I find these images from Wikipedia, uh, operating system uh, log. So in the, oper in the operating system, there's a concept <coughs> called CPU protection ring. So the operating system kernel, they will start with ring zero, and then the ring zero will start all the hardware-related stuff, and then you will go with ring one, ring two, and then all, all the way up to ring three. And then all the applications will only have the ring three's privileges. So that will making sure that your applications will not just uh, changing the kernel stuff. For example, like turning on the laptop camera. So as you can see, the kernel, it started with ring zero. So when we go back here and to see, since this is Erlang kernel, and then the OTP ring zero starting to make sense. And then also I find some relationship between the OTP and uh, Beijing city. Uh, this is Beijing's ring road. Uh, the only difference is OTP is starting with ring zero and Beijing city is starting with ring two, uh, two, three, five, six. And then guess where the Tiananmen Square is? It's uh, right here in the middle. That's, that's where the kernel, the, the, in, a, in a literal sense, is. The forbidden city is right here. That's where the in Paris lives. Okay, so uh, with all these knowledges, and then the first process, they start with zero, 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 and then they, it goes a lot of ways and then do a bunch of stuff. And then finally, after the Erlen beam started, we get this supervision tree for the kernel application. So how does the first init process to know what to do 
when they start when they you know start everything up. Like this process need to be start first, and then that process need to be start second. So the answer is boot script. When we uh, when we type the Erlang, it's the same as we typing Erlang boot start. So the start is actually the Erlang beam will looking for a file called start.boot file. So that file is located as the same directory with your Erlang installation. By default, it comes with four, the start and start clean, they're the same. Uh, the start clean, they, they're just gonna start the kernel and the standard library application. Uh, the SASO will include the SASO application, and no dot Erlang will, uh, will not include the dot Erlang file. So those files contain the specific instructions for the beam what needs to be started at what order. And then here, uh, those, are all, though those, are, those boot files are written in the binary format. It's normally generated by some program. Uh, the distillery or the rebar 3 will generate that for our release. Uh, but we can, there is the equivalent human readable version, it's called a script. Uh, we can just uh, read that. Like that, it's just a, a, a big file containing all the instructions, like what modules need to be preloaded, and then how to set the path, and then how to load the modules for the kernel, lab, and so on and so forth, up to uh, up to everything is started. And also, there's a option for the Erlang is called init debug, which is very useful if you if you have some boot file but it has trouble booting up your uh, booting up your Erlang beam, so you can type this in a debug, it will print out some debug information that's for you to debug later. Okay, so when uh, we start a beam, there are two modes here. One is called uh, interactive, which is a default one. And in the interactive mode, if we type in some command, for example, let's type crypto, uh, strong rend bytes one. It's gonna give me a, a random bytes, right? And there's another mode here. It's called embedded. So in this embedded mode, if I'm typing the crypto strong rend bytes, it's gonna complaining that there's an undefined function cry crypto strong rend bytes. So the read, uh, so the difference between the interactive and embedded is for the interactive if the Erlang beam encounters some module that it doesn't see before, it's trying to load it at dynamically. Uh, whereas for the embedded mode, when it sees some, some uh, modules it's not seeing, it's not going to try to load it. For the release that we're having, it's all running on the embedded mode. Uh, and also, so what module needs to be loaded is all gonna be in that uh, start boot file. So in that file, it telling you what to do, what module needs to start it. So in the interactive mode, in here, so how does the Erlang to know where to find the crypto module? The answer is, uh, let's, let's take a look at uh, the shell, our shell. When we type a command like pwd, uh, how does shell find where this, pro where this command is? So there's a system variable called pass. If we do that, uh, so the shell is gonna find the PWD program in the path, along the, along the path, it's gonna find the very first one. So if we type hello, it's trying everyone and it doesn't have it, so it's just gonna give up. So it's the kernel of the Erlang is using exactly the same mechanism for this. So in here, we can do code get pass to see what are the actual paths in my Erlang session. And in here, as you can see, the dot, it's the, the first pass. So that's why when you put some Erlang beam in your current directory, it's gonna be load. And then it's gonna look for the kernel, center lab, and then the rest are the applications that Erlang shipping with Erlang. Okay, now let's take a look at the, actually let's take a look at the Elixir. When we start an IEX section with Elixir, let's take a look on the pass, get pass. So in here, as we can see that uh, in Elixir, it's really, it's just adding the path for the Elixir's binaries uh, in here. So that, uh, like this, this is a Elixir's module, applications um, path. So in here, if we type IO puts, one, two, three. So what happened is it's going to try to load the IO.beam file 
the elixir IO bin dot file. So in that path. So in here we can actually do let's start a an Erlen shell. And then if we do elixir IO dot puts, let's try to call some elixir code in Erlen from Erlen. One, two, three, dot, and it's gonna complaining because there's no way to for the Erlen node to find out the elixir.io. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna add the path A for the ones we just copied for the for this Erlen instance. Now let's try to call the elixir IO. Now it's gonna find the path and load the module, and then we are able to call the elixir code in Erlen. Okay, and also if we take a look in here, the Elixir coming with uh, you know six applications. It's not feasible for every application. We just add those by hand. So what we can do is we just need to grab the common up to the lib part, copy that, and in here, Erlen provide a system variable called erlibs. You just put that libs here, and then start with your Erlen. And in here, let's try to call some Elixir code. It's just gonna work like that. In fact, uh, if you use Control G to uh, to do some uh, to start a new shell, we can also start a Elixir shell in our Erlen shell like this, and then connect to that shell. So right now we are in the Elixir like this. So it's very useful if you you know if you're in an Erlen shell, you already start a bunch of applications, and then you want to do something in Elixir. And then we can also switch back to Erlen. So now we are in Erlen. It's all the past thing. Okay, so with this, all of this work has been accomplished by a process called code server. And in code server, you can get the mode and then do all the things we mentioned before. And then the code server provide the code module as the APIs in here. Okay, cool. Now let's take a look at the Hello World again. Okay, so when we type the Hello World, of course, the I/O module will be first be find it by the by the code server. It will load the module, and then it's once it's load the module, it's gonna call the format function like this. And actually, let's start with a uh, distributed Erlen. Let's give it a short name as A. And in here, uh, if we do the IO format, it's gonna print Hello World in here. So now let's spawn a new process. Let's do the same thing. Okay, now that we spawn a new process, that new process print Hello World to the shell, and we can see the Hello World. It's, uh, it's, it's not impressive, I know. And uh, in here, uh, we, we start another shell called uh, B in here. So for the spawn function, we can uh, we can give another uh, argument, which is uh, which is the name of the node. So if we uh, spawn, if we do that, and it's actually it's printing out the hello world in here. This is actually very impressive because what happened here is uh, we are spawning a new process on the second beam down here. It's a separate OS system uh, OS process. However, even though it's it spawned in that beam and then however it print out the hello world in my first shell. So how does that work? Let's let's actually try to change the IO format to Erlen display. Like that. So if we do the Erlen display, it actually gonna print out the stuff down here in the in the beam where we actually spawn the process. Because the Erlen display is just like the regular C's printf function. Because we start this process on the second node here, so that's how it's gonna you know, just print out on the second node. But then how does the Erlen IO format can know where it's starting, where, where it's got started, and then direct the, the output to the correct shell? The answer is uh, group leader. Let's take a look. Okay, when we start a shell and then type the group leader, it's gonna give us the group leader of this process. So the group leader is a concept, it's, it's not being well documented, and also it's not being, uh, being mentioned a lot in the good Erlen books out there. Uh, I think because uh, it's just not, uh, not some concept that we need to know every day. 
but uh, but Erlen have this concept in order to make uh, what we see before happened. So the group leader is actually a very simple concept. So for every process in your beam, they belong to some kind of group. Let's take uh, our room for example, let's say everyone is a process and then in this room, we have one, uh, we have one person as our group leader. Let's say uh, uh, Eric here, he's our group leader. So now in every, for all our I.O. needs, we need to you know, say something, print something. We cannot say directly by ourselves. We have to give it to our group leader. We have to give the messages to Eric. And then it's Eric's job to get our messages and then send to somebody else. And then it's going to be broadcast in the room. And then everybody can, can listen to it. So the group leader is a concept just like that. So, we can, uh, so when we do the I.O. format Hello World, so what happened is a message has been sent to the group leader, like this. So a message looks like this. IO request, uh, self is who sent the module, uh, who sent the request, and then some reference, and then there is a put charts Unicode hello. So this is actually the IO protocol. So when we do that, a message was sent to the group leader. Group leader got the messages and then do something, print it out on the screen. And here, if we flush our mailboxes, we will get a message back of OK. So what happened on the I.O. format is actually send a message to the group leader, and then waiting there for some response. And then while well, the group leader printing stuff, delegating the message to someone else to print the stuff, it return a OK. And then that's why we see the OK message here. OK, so you will probably asking, why does Erlang go such a length to send some messages to just print out a simple message. Uh, let me show you an example here. For example, in this code, uh, in this code, it's just going to print out shell one every second, right, on my first shell. And in here, let's just uh, start another Erlen shell. So nothing shows up yet. And then we're going to run the same thing and do the shell 2. So now shell 2 is starting to print out. So what, what happened if we switch back to the first shell? And then the shell 1 is printing out. And then if we switch to shell 2, it's shell 2. And if we create a new one and then connect to that, nothing shows up. So this is actually very powerful because in the real life, when there are two shells, it could be in the two different users, two different machines. So it doesn't make sense. If I log in with my session and then I starting to see some output uh, initiated by some other users, which doesn't make sense, right? So uh, IO format and with the concept of gr the group leader, every process, they are, every shell you started they have a new group leader so that you just send stuff to your own group leader and then you are responsible. You will see your own output. So that makes sense, right? So for example, we are in here, the group leader. For the first shell is 64. Now let's start another shell. Now the group leader for the other shell is 86. It's, you can think of this as some, uh, somebody in that room. OK, and now what we're going to do is in here for the IO format, IO format can take uh, the first argument, which is the group leader. So by default, it's going to take your own group leader. But this time, we're not going to take our own group leader. We're going to take the group leader for the first shell, which is 64. 64, 0 here. OK, let's try that. OK, nothing shows up, and then the shell stuck here because it's not returned. Now let's switch back to the first shell. OK, now the first shell starting to show the command we issued on the second, the second shell. Uh, it, it's, it's like that, it's like, we are not, it's like we're not giving messages to Eric, but we're giving to the group leader to the other room. And then once we do that, instantly all the people in the other room starting to see the messages that we sent to them. So. Uh, in Erlang, it doesn't, it doesn't matter which uh, group leader. You can just send in to whoever group leader you want to, but by default, it's going to be the group leader of your own shell. 
Okay, so uh, as you can see that uh, the group leader here, the process number of the group leader is 64. So what happened when there's some I.O. need and there is the, this 64 is not even started? So uh, there, is a, there is a common default group leader called user. So if we send stuff to the user, and then it's gonna, uh, it's gonna channel to everybody here. So what happened if we are trying our example here and then send it to user? Like that, shell one. Okay, so now because our shell one, it belongs to that uh, user group so that we are seeing the output here. And now we start a new shell and then trying to do the connect to that, even though we didn't do anything but because we are the same group as the previous, we are all the same group for the, for the user. So that's why the different shell, doesn't matter how many shells you start, you're gonna see the messages for that application. So that's why when you, uh, when you remote connect to some node, and then you can see the output. It's because that output is gonna be channeled to the user, it's not channeled to that specific uh, shells group leader. Okay. Uh, so you might asking, uh, where is user? So the user's PID is 63. So what happened? What happened if I want to do some I/O things uh, even before this user was got started? So who should I send my I/O request to if there's no user started? Make a guess. The, yeah, exactly, the very first init process. So the init process is not only responsible for start everything up, it's also responsible for all the messages that no one knows how to take care of, and then just they're gonna do stuff. It feels like we are sending messages to the organizer of the code beam, to them, to him, and then every, everybody will get the messages. So that's an init process. Okay. So with a group leader and then uh, let's look at the supervision tree. We talk about the code server and user, right? And there the user is connected to this user drive. So what, what is this user drive? Uh, let's take a look, let's on the shell here. Okay, so now I'm pressing the number one and then the number one shows up, right? Nothing complicated in here. However, actually, there is four messages has been passing in this process. It's, it's look like this. Uh, when your Erlen node started, it's gonna call some C program and then start a TTYSL, which is a TTY slave process. And then that process is using a port 03 to connect to. And then when, we, when a user type a number one in your keyboard, and then this guy, will send a message to the user drive saying, okay, someone put a data one in here. And then the user drive will forward that message to your group leader on your current shell. And then your shell will do some transformation and then say, okay, here is the request, put charts Unicode one. And then uh, sending it back to the user drive. And then the user drive will send it back to the TTY slave and then when the TTY slave got a command zero one, zero means print some character. And at this time, you will see one starting on your screen. We can actually try this like this. Uh, for the user drive process, we're just gonna send a message like this. Okay, and this one just showed up. I didn't type it. Uh, if I try one, two, three, four, five, it's gonna show one, two, three, four, five. It's just a message passing. We are just a not. We are just not the key, actual keyboard, but emit, but uh, simulate the message passing in here. So we can do something uh, interesting. Like when we type one plus one dot and then enter, and then we got two. We type the keyboard for five times. So every time four messages is gonna pass in. So we have twenty messages sent uh, through. So what if we do this? Uh, one plus one and then carriage return. Okay, so now the shell thinks I'm typing all of this, one plus one, give me two. 
So actually, I can uh, I can just send. Remember the uh, control G. Just send the control G like this. So it will think I'm typing the control G like that. Okay, so uh, that's how shell works uh, along with this, uh, this uh, user drive. It's just a message passing along here. Okay, so uh, with all of these things, uh, we've only covered uh, like code server user and user drive, which is basically how the IO, puts, uh, IO format Hello World uh, works. Uh, obviously, we don't have enough time to say all of, all of the rest, but I do want to mention about these two processes right here. And it actually bothers me a long time that every time I start some supervision tree and I saw these two lonely processes sitting here, and I, I have no idea what they're doing, and there's no book explaining that, and there's no documentation explaining that. So uh, until I look some uh, source code, and this guy, the first guy, 45 here, is actually uh, the application master. So that process, it's the very first process got started with your own application. In this case, 45 is the first process with a kernel application. It's got started by the application controller. So the very first thing for this process to do is to changing itself as the group leader. So you can change group leader with any process. So this process just change itself as a group leader. So the reason why they want to do that has nothing to do with the IO. But there's a property with the group leader. It's when you, when, you are, when you have a group leader and you, you spawn some new process, all the process you spawn will inherit the same group leader of yourself. So all the processes here for the supervision tree, all the, all the rest of the children will be, have the same uh, group leader as 45. So there is uh, two reasons, at least two reasons for doing that. The first is for the child process up here, they know who my, who, my, who my application master is. So there are some code like, for example, like application get env. Uh, for those, if you just provide application get env, the actual environment, uh, the actual variable name, it's gonna, by default, thinking you are calling the application for your own application master. So with this setup, I can just uh, call that, it's very convenient. And another reason is for the application master, this 45, to know who, my, who am I responsible for, who my, all my child is. So when the, pro, when the application terminates itself, it's gonna terminate all the supervision tree and all, this, all the processes. However, it could be some processes not linked, right? So they are just gonna be wandering there. And then at that time, uh, the application master will, will take a look on how many current processes is and then to check each one if they have the group leader of myself. If they do, I'm just gonna kill it. So it's a good way to, uh, to clean up the loose end. So uh, again, it's not have something to do with the IO, but, um, but it's just a way that, uh, it's kind of hacky, but it's a way for the application to achieve this uh, method. And then what is, uh, so with this, why do I need the second guy? Uh, it's because when the first pro application master starting all the child processes, it has to wait in there, it's a synchronized process. So all the child process here will, will, will need to be started and then 45 will hang there uh, waiting for they finished. So what if one of the process down here, like the code server, they need to do some IO. As we see before, when they do the IO, they are sending a message to the application master. However, my application master right here, it's, it's waiting for them to finish. So now we have a deadlock situation. So in order to prevent that deadlock situation, we are the 45, they have a child process 46 to waiting there and starting everything up. And then the 45 again acting as the group leader. However, uh, when the code server, for example, sending some IO request to it, it doesn't know how to process it. It actually just forward to the real group leader, which is the init process. Okay, so that's why th we have these two lonely processes here uh, for each applications. Uh, okay, I think uh, with all of this, and also there's a lot of other uh, stuff in the, uh, in the kernel 
the OTB20 introduced a new logger. It's going to replace the error logger and also the disk log to log things on the disk. And Gen TCP UDP for the low-level network stuff. Erlen signal server to uh, capture the operating systems, the uh, kill signal, stuff like that. File server to do with the file. Uh, global PG2 with the process group. And heart is to it's acting like the system D is to monitor your Erlen beam when its crash is going to restart. RPC to talk to another Erlen node in the RPC and the OS with the OS uh, interface. So uh, most of them, they have the documentations on their, on their, uh, on, on their modules. However, uh, for some of them, like kernel ref C, it's saying on the code comments, this module implement, implements this, 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 and should not be documented nor used directly by user applications. So when you see that, you know, you know too much. You're going to stop. OK. So now uh, with the Chaos Monkey methodology, uh, Chaos Monkey is used by Netflix to randomly queue your server in production and to see how good it recovers. However, uh, as we know that we have a lot of processes, so just the simply random killing the process in your Erlen beam is dangerous because if we accidentally kill the, like for, for example, the init process or the user process, and then basically nothing will work and it will also crash your beam. So we shall only random kill the process belongs to your application. And the resources here would be mostly the kernels, documentations, and also the uh, kernel source and ERTS preloaded source. And that's it. I hope you will understand IO, how the hollow world works in Erlen uh, better right now. Thank you. Yes. What was your methodology for researching this? Uh, the question is, what's uh, my methodology to researching this? Uh, mostly, it's uh, I would like to go over through all the documentations that Erlen provided, because the, the documentation actually is, is very good. And, uh, and also, I have uh, internal uh, driving to you know, understand what are these two processes. <laughs> So uh, it goes a little bit uh, further, but uh, I hope uh, I hope that in the community, uh, also I, I see a lot of good code usages in the uh, in the in the kernel, uh, which can be uh, which can be used in our day-to-day -day life, uh, coding coding work. So I I'd encourage the community to take a look into the kernel and then write more you know, uh, blog posts, articles, and talks on the kernel. Yes. So the question is, when we send messages to the user process, does the user process broadcast the message to every, every uh, process that uh, belongs to that same group? That's a very good question. And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> But I'd encourage you to find it out and uh, share with the community. Yeah. Yes. That's right, that's right. So the comment was the, the idea of the message passing in the kernel, it uh, it's can be used on the application level. You know, since Erlen kernel is awesome and never dies, so we should adopt these things in our application logics. Yeah, that's a very good comment. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>